I just did the land acknowledgement people in the computer um, and just to reflect that within the school, we do try to look at how we can take measurable steps to improve uh, how we work with and partner with our uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities through research, teaching and service. Um, so thanks everyone for coming in person. People in the computer still love you, but you miss good salads and snacks. Um, and I will turn it back over to Chris. John, we're just thrilled to have you and we look forward to the talk. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so this event uh, is put on by the uh, Janet Wenny and John Last family. Uh, and to give a few words ab about John Last, who was a, a former fac faculty member in our department, uh, we have a video from Ian McDowell, who was not able to be here today. As his beloved wife, Wendy, was in declining health due to ALS, John hatched the idea of setting up a John and Wendy Last Memorial Fund. Characteristically, he did not dictate how the fund should be used because he recognized that times and priorities change. It is also characteristic that he put both of their names on the fund, for Wendy was his muse, his traveling companion, and was at the very center of his worldwide span of friends and colleagues. He knew that without her support, he would never have achieved what he did. John Last liked to claim that the Lord put him on this earth to be an editor, and at this he excelled. Not only did he edit the Canadian Journal of Public Health for many years, but also three editions of the massive Maxi Rosenau Public Health textbook, which then was renamed Maxi Rosenau Last. His dictionaries of epidemiology and later of public health are internationally renowned. In the political arena, he was a vocal advocate for ethical standards in public health practice and research. John worked at lightning speed. He maintained personal friendships with leading figures in epidemiology across the world. He had the ability to encourage, badger, or cajole people into producing manuscript on time, and then to survive his instant and detailed editing of their text. He loved language and dismissed unclear thought and needless words. At one time or another, we all experienced the sharp end of his editorial pen, but it was always employed in the interest of improving our work. Well into his retirement, John diversified his editorial attention to support Wendy's creativity. He was proud of her paintings, which hung on their apartment walls, and assembled these into a privately published volume of her art and poems. In his late 80s, he drew on memories of the Adelaide of his youth to write an adventure story for children. This featured a wise talking parrot that guided a group of children to hidden treasure and then saved them from a band of splendidly evil adults hell-bent on seizing the treasure. John could be relied on to deliver an opinion in any situation. After Wendy died, we often met for beer and some lunch. My role was chiefly to get him to expound on politics, on the latest Anna Maria Tremonti broadcast, on his own podcasts, or the various novels he had read the previous week. But his favorite topic remained to update me on his children and grandchildren, of whom he was immensely proud. Unsentimental, John was always ready with a disparaging yet witty comment, dismissing a colleague's contribution. Ah, he's about as welcome as a gonococcus with bad breath. The license plate on the small car he purchased in his late 70s was last one, and he seemed entirely adjusted to his own mortality, which came towards the end of 2019 at the age of 92. We hope that this series of presentations will combine the amazing diversity of John's academic interests with Wendy's sensitivity and deep caring for humanity. Um, and uh, we also have another video uh, made by uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Kruski, who's a faculty member in our department, who's also an old friend of, of Dr. Samet's, who uh, really wanted to provide some opening remarks for this talk, but unfortunately had to be away. He's uh, has a conflict with a, a conference that he's hosting uh, at Health Canada. So 
Um, we have a, a short video uh, and then we'll get to our, our speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniel Kursky, a professor here in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health since 1998. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to say a few words of introduction about my longtime colleague and mentor, Dr. Jonathan Samet, who will give the second annual Janet Wendy and John Last Memorial Lecture. My brief remarks will focus on two major studies led by John. In 1998, John chaired a U.S. National Research Council committee that I served on with him, convened to oversee a $440 million program to define research priorities to better understand the public health impacts of airborne particulate matter, which we now know accounts for some 8 million deaths each year worldwide. Under John's leadership, the committee produced four major reports documenting progress made towards filling the major data gaps defined by the committee. More recently, John has provided guidance on integrating evidence from multiple evidence streams, including being asked by the World Health Organization to lead a review and update of the evidence integration framework used by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. This initiative brought systematic review and new mechanistic characteristics of cancer-causing substances into the updated framework. I'll finish with a photo of John and I working with colleagues at Johns Hopkins University, where he served as an outstanding chair of the Department of Epidemiology for many years. John, you'll recognize uh, Tom Burke and Ron White standing between you and I in this photo. These examples of Dr. Samet's many accomplishments illustrate the insightful leadership and enormous influence he has had on the fields of epidemiology and public health, both in the United States and internationally. John, we're delighted to have you back in Ottawa to give the Janet, Wendy, and John last lecture this afternoon. Let's see, you can hear me. That's true. You know, this reminds me of giving a lecture to medical students because they're all like in the back and the front rows are... When I was at Hopkins, I used to give lectures to the... Uh, taught epi one to the uh, mph students coming in and the lecture hall was almost filled the front rows were just always empty and i would walk into the back and say okay what are you ordering on amazon and uh, <laughs> you know what whatever um, else but it's uh so quick audience poll students students here and you know, you're clustered um <laughs> faculty staff Uncertain, uncertain, okay, all right, I'm, I'm in that group. Um, so I did want to make a comment about uh, Dan Kruski. It's too bad he's not here. I'm sure he owes me a paper or something. Uh, but we started working together uh, on the problem of radon risk assessment uh, in a committee of the National Academy of Sciences that I chaired, then went on to work on air pollution, particulate matter, and uh, other um, Things and I've always enjoyed my intersections uh, with Dan. And I'm sorry that we didn't have a chance to catch up. I do want to make a few comments about John Last, and I, I don't know I met him on multiple occasions, and I'm not sure when, but a long time ago is probably the right start. You know, I think um, I'm going to show you a few of his papers, and there's a lesson here because everything that everybody thinks is new or somebody just discovered. It was found long ago. And looking back at John's papers, there, there were so many prescient things that he said and did. And here are some of those uh, books that were mentioned. The Dictionary of Epidemiology was really useful because epidemiologists can't even agree what epidemiology is. I took a methods class at Harvard when I was getting my master's in epi, and it was taught by somebody named Ole Mietten. And if you've heard the name, it strikes, still strikes fear into the hearts of those who were his students. He spent two first two weeks of class in a monologue with himself about what epidemiology was. So I don't know whether the definitions in the dictionary were right or not, but at least you could refer to it and say, stop it, let's get to work. And here's, here's the definition. Um, the Maxi Rosenau last text is, here, and Maxie was actually in the succession of chairs of epidemiology at Johns Hopkins, one I later stepped into for 14 years with my colleague and friend Ana Navas at Columbia. We 
edited the um, environment and occupational health sections in this last version. And this will be the last, I'm gonna keep using that word, last time that uh, I'm involved, but we did 19 uh, chapters and this is an extraordinary volume. It's so big now that you can sort of don't really pick it up. And I'm afraid if I open it, it's just gonna fall apart, but there's a lot in public health. And then just a few of John's papers. And the one in 1960 is on the health of immigrants based on his clinical experiences in uh, Australia. And I think John appreciated this intersection of the clinical and public health worlds. They're together, and I'll show you a quote to that effect, but this um, 1985 paper with Kirk Smith, who became the guru of the problem of biomass fuel smoke, biomass smoke, uh, was pioneering, and John was the last, uh, last author. Here's uh, comments about the biomass fuel combustion problem. One we're still trying to solve, and one we know that affects you know, some billions around the uh, world. Another quote on ecology, ecological change. Notice the word climate in there. It's, it's in there somewhere. And uh, implications for human health of five large-scale ecological disruptions were explored. Climate change. Okay, there it is. This is 30 years ago. Okay, and then just last one uh, on his from his paper on obligations and responsibilities of epidemiologists to research subjects. And again, notice what he covered, including the responsibility for feedback to participants and populations and the ethics of what we all need to do. So ahead of his time, and just moving from what John said to what I'm gonna talk about, again, I think this goal of improving health, and I'm gonna talk about that from the point of view of reducing risk and reducing risks to um, health. Our prevention challenge uh, is here. So this is one of those multi-level diagrams about what makes us healthy or not. And it's going at the bottom from genes, the top up to global. And, you know, we love to talk about multi-level things and putting everything together and using our statistical friends to uh, try and model all this. The world is really messy because now we think about life course epidemiology and look at that, a, a miracle of animation. Uh, believe me, I did not do that, um, but it's complicated. So we have multi-levels, things influencing our health, moving across the lifespan. And how do we sort of understand what are the points of intervention and what we are going to do? That's, that's a big job. I gave, and some of these remarks come from a lecture that I gave at Imperial in the fall that Jeffrey Rose lecture at Imperial. And for those of you who know his work, um, he looked at the idea of populations and sicker versus healthier populations. The inspirational uh, figure here is blood pressure comparing London civil servants with Kenyans and rural, rural Kenyan, in fact, in this, as I recall, Kenyan nomads, and two different diff distributions of blood pressure. And, and of course, what we want to do in public health is shift the distributions and likely to truncate the tails. And so we have to think about what drives the body of the distribution and what puts people out in that end of the distribution where their health is perhaps inequitably affected. And I've sort of used this analogy that we want to deal with the body of the whale, the distribution, and the tail of the distribution, which is the fringe. So we have to think about what drives the shape of the distribution and how we might move it to the left and how we deal with the tail, which may contain people who experience unacceptable risk, likely because of who they are, where they live, what air they breathe, and uh, so on. So that's our prevention challenge. And in terms of thinking about these curves, there may be different curves for different populations, and they may move to greater or lesser extents, depending on 
what puts people in their particular position on the uh, curve. So in the end, what we wanna do is use evidence that we generate from a search to create action that will change these distributions. And I'm gonna talk about how we do that. And I'm gonna offer some totally artificial models that um, have to be artificial, but I think they're useful. And uh, that we'll stick with. So back to this, and how do we intervene at these different levels? So just some ideas. We try and change behaviors of individuals. We try and change behaviors at perhaps the local level, the state level, even the global level. We have other tools like regulation, which comes in at these upper stream levels. We have developing guidelines on what we should do, what clinicians should do, public health guidelines about you know, what we should eat or how much alcohol we should drink or whatever else. And you know, we have the tool of litigation, which is useful in some sectors of public health. I was involved in the uh, tobacco uh, litigation in the United States. It proved to be very powerful in several respects. One, it brought us the access to the industry documents, which to no surprise showed us that the tobacco industry did bad things knowingly. Um, it brought us some compensation to do things in public health, not as much as we should have. So litigation can have a purpose. It can force regulation when there's delay and dallying. So again, a, a powerful tool and one that I've had come to develop more appreciation of. So what do we need to cause action? Well, we need evidence, which I'll take as what we know. And the complement of evidence is ignorance, which is what we don't know. And I recommend, uh, I read this book a long time ago, the uh, Ignorance book by Feierstein, who was a, a neuroscientist at Columbia who taught a class on ignorance to undergraduates. And um, it was very good at sort of saying, think about what you know. That's really a challenge. What do we really know? And if somebody asks you, why do, we, why do you know what you know? Does, if I said, does, Eric, does cigarette smoking cause lung cancer? Would everybody say yes? It's okay to say yes. Yeah, you would. Okay. And if I said, does, here's a more sophisticated question. Does cigarette smoking cause breast cancer? So glass, you 100% with that, Smita? Yeah. Okay. All right. We can we can we can go over that. Okay. And then and then of course part of our problem is that we have doubt creation as a sort of contrast, you know, to conflict with evidence. And I'll talk about this. And of course, there's a doubt creation industry. And I think we have to credit the tobacco industry with creating the contemporary paradigm of doubt. Um, creation. And, you know, there's lots of books. Um, David Michaels had the first, his most recent book is about two years old, The Triumph of Doubt. And it's a little bit gloomy, in fact, in terms of the success of these strategies. And we could probably just pause here and talk about doubt creation during the pandemic and what it's uh, done and what some of the damage uh, has been. So if we look at action and evidence, so as researchers, we generate evidence that we hope will be useful. And in public health, I think most of us have in mind at the start of a particular study or analysis, who's going to care about the results? Or you should have that in mind. I know if you're perhaps doing a PhD, you care about that because you want to get your degree and get done. But in the end, I used to torture my students at Hopkins with this, the so what question. You know, in the end, after you've published your paper, what difference will it really, uh, really make? So we have evidence and we have uncertainty sort of balancing out against each other. But let's face it, the world is more complicated and we have evidence, we have uncertainty and we have everything else. OK, and I think the world has gotten even more complicated because um, we now have misinformation and disinformation, which I think is different from uncertainty. And that's deliberately injecting something there that's not, in fact, 
what it is, what what the world is. So it's it's complicated, and I think this formulation is useful. One of the public health controversies now that many of you know about is whether electronic cigarettes are useful for public health. Are they a harm reduction strategy? Heard of that, everybody? Yeah. And are they useful for harm reduction? All in favor? Opposed? No opposed? Opposed? You can be, wait a minute, you can do both. <laughs> I, I saw some switching going on here. So, you know, this kind of framework is useful. So who benefits from harm reduction? So if the yardstick for toxicity is the combustible cigarette, anything else is less toxic. Okay, so if somebody said to me qualitatively, smoke cigarette, inhaled electronic product, which is going to be less risky, I'll say electronic product. Um, who benefits? Perhaps current smokers who switch uh, do benefit, and maybe particularly those who have disease already, cardiovascular or respiratory disease. Um, who's harmed? Well, maybe smokers are because instead of quitting, they stay nicotine addicted. Maybe some former smokers exposed to nicotine say, gosh, I really miss it, and I've got to have a drag. And that's the start, and that's the typical story of getting cued. Um, and then, of course, um, the safest thing, the best thing would be to completely quit and not have the additional toxicity of the electronic product. But what about this? Are kids potentially harmed? Sure, absolutely. And could these products be the entry point for nicotine addiction? Very complicated story. And then they face whatever risks may come as they perhaps pursue a life during which they are nicotine addicted. Okay, so now let's look at it. Um, parents, who's parents? Parents here? Would you want your child to risk becoming nicotine addicted so a 60-year-old smoker has some benefits when you want to trade off your kid? Probably not. Probably not. So this, this is really a complicated story because there's a risk trade-off here. There's actually an intergenerational risk trade-off. So I show this only because I want to say that the stuff I'm showing, I think, is actually useful. And uh, I've seen the arguments which I've been involved in about the harm reduction story is sort of poorly framed because the risk trade-off is not so well understood. Then we have the acute pulmonary toxicity. Uh, here's a useful definition of acceptable risk. A thing is safe if its risks are judged to be acceptable. And, you know, I see us doing research as in the side of estimating what the risks are. And the broader judgment of acceptability is a societal one. Okay, so it's not really to the research community to say that a lifetime risk of one in 100,000 because of exposure to X is acceptable. That's really a broader decision that's made by uh, all of us. But we're in the business of trying to help understand the problem of risk by um, measuring it. And I think we should, and I try to do this, not step into the realm of saying, what is uh, acceptable. So here's my artificial paradigm for going from research and evidence to um, action. So we do research, and I'll put much of public health research into the applied realm, although some of it is discovery related. Our funders sort of point us in the direction of what we can do, being realistic. And then researchers do it, and we generate evidence. And I think increasingly, as a basis for decision making, we're putting that evidence together doing systematic um, review, which has created all kinds of new issues, problems, concerns, and appropriately, because we probably should be reviewing everything we know to decide what the evidence is rather than, as I used to say, well, here's what John Samet thinks is the right thing and the pile of evidence is this, and here's my five favorite studies. So you can't do that anymore. And then we typically often make causal judgments as a basis for decision-making, i.e. smoking causes cancer. 
And we may do some form of formal risk assessment or informal risk assessment to decide how big a problem is as a basis for setting priorities and what should be done. And then action, which may be just prescribed under a regulatory framework, a personal decision-making framework, many different levels at which actions may be taken. And this is certainly a non-scientific realm or influenced by sort of non-science, thinking back to my balancing scales and sort of everything else category. So how do we decide about what we're gonna do? Well, an unacceptable risk at the individual or population level. In the environment world, concerns about environmental justice and health equity, and certainly those health equity concerns sweep widely uh, as they should. Regulatory requirements, uh, litigation, I have to say, um, I don't, you're probably more spared this. There's on TV, on radio, certain things are just constant calls for people to be involved in lawsuits related to environmental things. And if you follow these right now, there's firefighting foams, which would be PFAS substances. If you know about the Marine Base Camp Lejeune, where there's compensation under federal law, it just, the list goes on and on and on. Um, I'm not sure this is the best way to address risk, but it's ever a threat, particularly in the U.S. And of course, the work of uh, advocates who may range from those motivated by the science they've done to a broad range of people who will be involved. We have tools like risk assessment, cost analysis, population uh, impact assessment, health impact assessment, and more. So I'm going to do a quick example, and then I'm going to turn and uh, spend the rest of my time on uh, air pollution. So here's my diagram for tobacco. And if you look at uh, tobacco, the drivers do truly extend from individual characteristics, maybe some genetic susceptibility to nicotine addiction or to lung injury or to whatever else up to the global level, uh, where right now the industry's consolidated probably to about five major companies, uh, BAT, Philip Morris International, China National Tobacco, uh, et cetera. So if you think about this, if we want to deal with the tobacco problem, we have a global industry to deal with. Uh, we have the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, WHO's first public health treaty. Uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies has supported global tobacco control and just uh, added an additional $425 million to the support they are giving to global tobacco uh, control. And then down to the individual level, do I want to quit? Do I want to start? Um, <laughs> they're enjoying the talk. Um, so uh, in any case, tobacco works. And if you look at this is the U.S. tobacco consumption, cigarette smoke per person. It rose because the industry did many things, and it fell because public health found many things through research and became the trigger for action. So if you look at key smoking events in the U.S., um, this, acceler this fall, which began around 1960, was evidence-driven in many ways, the evidence on active smoking and the evidence on uh, passive smoking. And again, just so if you look at what happened, you know, the science, for example, on indoor air and passive smoking. And, um, you know, it's pretty amazing because if I asked who's been on an airplane with smoking actually going on, you have to have a certain hair color to raise your hand. And, um, Otherwise, you know, it's not meant, it's hard to imagine that people used to smoke on airplanes, but they sure did. And um, why don't they smoke now? Well, because obviously it pollutes the aircraft cabin. Um, litigation, regulation, all those things that I talked about happened and the curve fell. So I'm gonna go on to um, air pollution and talk this, so I'm going to talk a little bit, sorry, from the U.S. Uh, perspective and talk about how um, the uh, air quality regulation changed. And here's this uh, 
paradigm that I had uh, talked about, does air pollution pose a hazard to health? Well, absolutely. And um, a few years ago, we had the Monet exhibit came to Denver. And this, uh, I love the paintings, but this quote really caught, caught me. What I like most of all in London is the fog. Okay, and what were the fogs? Air pollution events. And people burned coal in their homes and uh, the air would stagnate and the levels of air pollution were spectacular by uh, today's standards. So for those of you who are doing air pollution, oh, that doesn't work, doing air pollution stuff, the scale here is milligrams uh, of uh, particles, smoke is particles. And this is the London fog of 52. Okay, and I, I love this plot. There's no doubt, looking at it, you can see sulfur dioxide going out, sulfur from the coal, and particles going up, and then that's going up. Do you think this demonstrates a causal relationship? Yeah? Okay. All right, so then, and what else is interesting here? Look at the curve of deaths. And notice it stays up after the um, fog, the particle levels fell. And that was the lasting effect. And there are some, there's a number of deaths here still debated, but 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 extra deaths. And uh, for the statisticians, if you were to count the data points here, there's 47. Okay, and you don't need any sort of advanced time series method to figure out that something went on. This is what we don't want to happen again, and I worry that it could. But so there is a hazard, and there's those 47 uh, data points. So in terms of the work on air pollution, the generation of evidence, the air pollution research was ignited by the London fog of 52, first in the UK, then in the US, and the methods actually spread to researchers in uh, Canada, some very prominent respiratory physicians became involved in air pollution uh, research. And so early on, simple things were done, surveys, health of people in clean cities, clean towns, quote, dirty towns. Uh, then uh, was there a hazard? And then what are the different effects? A very important longitudinal study began in 1970. Four, the Harvard Six Cities study. Uh, Dan Kruski and folks here were involved later in a reanalysis of data from that and the American Cancer Society study, which was not started to study air pollution per se, but cancer in general. And then my colleagues at the University of Southern California, where I spent nine years, launched something called the Children's Health Study that is still going on. We learned how to measure exposures to air pollution. We put monitors on people and began to think about things. One of the first big findings from putting monitors for particles on people was that a major driver of particle exposures was smoking indoors. And big, big, uh, big surprise. And then uh, we began to say, how does the risk relationship vary? As exposure goes up, what happens to risk? And that's the basis for setting a standard and seeing how things going down. We began to do time series studies with lots of data and then be putting together larger and larger data sets. And now we've been doing, Canada has been involved in uh, these studies. Uh, studies of very large populations. Your Canadian census cohorts have been part of work done by uh, Mike uh, Brower, Rick uh, Burnett and, uh, and others. So this is a long story. We've generated a lot of evidence and um, the question now is how low should standards go? And what do we need to do to protect the public health? Oops. We have plenty of papers coming out. And this is just crude search. And look at the epidemiologists. Publication numbers for searches on epidemiology and air pollution. What, 2,400 papers? Impossible to keep up uh, and utilize all this. So we have to go to new ways to do this. And if we look over time, Here's early, this is 1948 in the US. Paper, again, this goes back to the hazard uh, over time, the work on the London fog. These are the early days when the events were there and we just counted the bodies. And then as time went on, we began to do epidemiology, epidemiological studies. 
Ben Ferris was the pioneer in uh, the United States, bringing spirometers uh, into homes. Uh, and there's just a flood of publications from the UK, uh, here looking at air pollution in the city street, something we still worry about. Uh, reviews coming along, putting the evidence together. Um, this was part of the wave of studies that began around 1990 that looked at day-to-day -day variation in mortality and the links to air pollution. And these studies triggered a relook. We had thought we had reached safe levels of particles in the air. And these studies said, no, we haven't. Uh, and then a paper from the Harvard Six Cities study showing that longer term mortality was linked to particle levels. Okay, so we had short term variations in air pollution leading to mortality, longer term variations leading to mortality. So the story on evidence was starting to come together. These studies were controversial, and we were actually funded shortly after I came to Hopkins in 94 to redo a lot of the early analysis in this validation idea. So here's a paper we uh, published relooking at Philadelphia. Again, this was actually congressionally requested to look at what these studies were telling us. And you know, they just go on and on and on. This is a, a paper we published in uh, 2000, where we used data from the 19 largest US cities. So we developed the ability with our data handling and modeling to go from one city at a time to a bunch. And that, as you'll see, uh, became larger. Using our national cohorts, Medicare, this study involves millions of people. And then these pooling, this is pooling data from 652 studies. So we've gone from one city and short time series to very involved global studies uh, at, this, uh, at this point. So the evidence is piling up. Now, so what do we do with it? So I'm gonna talk about the US because there's a, a process to use uh, evidence. And we have to meet the mandate of the Clean Air Act, which says we have to set a standard that is based on the evidence, the evidence, the word criteria here in red, means evidence and allows for an adequate margin of safety to protect the public health. It's gotten very challenging to meet that because we keep finding effects at lower and lower uh, levels. We have a process to use evidence. And this is uh, a process that starts with peer reviewed scientific studies over here in that box I'm trying to get to and ends with a standard. And along the way, the evidence is gathered and, and synthesized in this integrated scientific assessment. It goes on through different analyses and risk assessments and a standard results. Okay, so that is the process. We do systematic review and meta-analyses as part of this process. And those of you should recognize a forest plot here with some, uh, some different uh, studies. And um, the WHO follows a somewhat similar step, set of steps now in requiring for the air quality guidelines a systematic review <laughs> to uh, pull together all the evidence. So again, the um, WHO sets guidelines through this uh, process. And I was, I was involved in both the 2000 five guidelines and then the more recent revisions. In 2005, uh, about 20 of us spent a week in Bonn writing and saying, we think the numbers should be here, here, or here. And in 2021, for the guidelines, we had five years of meetings and multiple systematic reviews. So again, an evidence-based uh, process. Part of the process is burden estimation. And here's the head of WHO saying that, um, that in fact, air pollution is new tobacco. This comes out of this attributable risk kind of stuff. And these burden estimates are now turning out to be useful to motivate action. So again, I'm gonna have a little quiz for you here. So what does this mean? 
6.7 million deaths are attributable to air pollution. Who wants to take that one on? If nobody volunteers, I'll volunteer Melissa. Anybody, any takers on what that means? What does it, what does it mean? All right. I'm sorry, I'm getting didactic now. What does it mean if the US Surgeon General says 480,000 deaths are attributable to smoking? It means you have to do something. No, it means if nobody smokes, there'd be that many fewer deaths. You win. There's no prize, but um, <laughs> so so there's a counterfactual behind these estimates. Okay, and the counterfactual for smoking is obvious is nobody should smoke. And the counterfactual for air pollution is that you've turned that distribution into the other distribution. Okay, hard to explain, isn't it? Um, so in any case, these burden estimates are important. And now because I can see that Judy's worried about time, I am going to accelerate and we're gonna skip all that. And I will say that the burden is big the burden falls inequitably around the world. And let me just go. So we've improved in the US. These are the US data on particles gone down, okay? But not for everybody. And this shows in a very complicated way, a very interesting paper, that those people contributing to the air pollution loading of the atmosphere the ones who contribute the least are experiencing the more in terms of adverse health effects, okay? So again, this paradigm of looking at the whole distribution and the tail of distribution works. So I'm gonna finish up and just say there, my paradigm that there are inherent problems. So one is what research gets funded and can we fund the necessary research we need? And, um, Dan mentioned, Kruski mentioned the particulate matter research agenda, one of those rare instances where we were able to target funding, a lot of it, to address needed problems. We all do research, and we want to do research that is meaningful. This is from paper in The Lancet a few years back, talking about relevant to advancing knowledge and relevant to application. And there's this Richard Dahl quadrant down here, which is where we'd like our research uh, to be. Um, okay. And this targeted uh, research agenda was just a good example already mentioned. We have to pull together the evidence and that's become this domain of systematic review, uh, of course. Systematic, who's done a systematic review here? A lot of work. A lot of agony, a lot of frustration, making those tables up and dealing with messy studies. It's a horrible mess to do these and we have to do them. So we're left with that and that's created problems. And I would just say that in the environmental world, things are still in flux about how to do this. And gauging cause remains challenging. And again, uh, for those who have sat with a stack of evidence and tried to say, does A cause B, knowing the consequences of saying that, it's a big deal. And so, you know, you can use my cause meter, um, but um, beyond that, so uh, moving on. And, you know, part of the game has been, if you don't like the conclusions from something, question how it was done, question the causal criteria. And we just went through the, an episode of this in the, uh, U.S. with questioning about how we approach things um, with the Environmental Protection Agency. Expert judgment remains key, and one group of experts may plausibly reach a different conclusion from another, and that's certainly understandable. But we need more work there. And I'm really gonna move on now. Uh, risk assessment, quantitatively important, and then coming to action. And again, this is the non-science part. Okay, where so many things uh, figure in. Uh, the tobacco case, you know, the uh, industry, as I said, masterminded this strategy of creating doubt. This is a paper that Tom Burke and I wrote quite a while ago on the secondhand story, secondhand smoke story, turning science into junk. 
Uh, and they systematically uh, went after things and did that. And they just sort of turned epidemiology upside down to uh, do this. Um, their actions led to their indictment under the uh, Racketeering Act in the United States. They uh, misinterpreted, misled on the science. So, so um, what do we do? You know, and how do we push and against all these factors? This is a uh, paper that we wrote at the start of the Trump administration. Uh, and you can see what we said, Trump administration environment, heed the science, kind of something different happened. And, um, you know, all my friends wrote and said, gosh, that's exactly what I would have said, which, of course, was fairly useless uh, because it wasn't my friends we were writing this um, to. So I'm really now going to, I'm really now going to end and, you know, one of the worries here is that um, evidence is being summarily dismissed now in the political context and has become politicized. It's, it's worrisome. Uh, so, um, you know, my, my wife just hates this movie because every time we go to an airplane, it's there, I watch it again. And, um, you know, but I, I thought this fits because, you know, we've all learned evidence here but opinion here, and they're somehow being weighted the same way. And, and this is worrisome, and I think you know, we have so many lessons from COVID. So I'm gonna stop here because I do wanna say we have to be optimistic, and good science is still critical in public health. So uh, good luck to um, everybody. And I think you know, looking back on my career, that of many folks here I know, uh, you can make uh, a difference. So, you know, don't don't give up. I mean, to think back 40 years ago, we might have been sitting here and half the audience would have been smoking. So, um, you know, what can I say? My, we used to go in medical school. Now, now I'm really done with my talk. But in medical school, we used to go watch these autopsies sitting in the little bleachers around. We had uh, Dr. Oh, what was his name? Hawkins. And he would be sitting there going, and here's the liver uh, smoking. You know, and, and for those of you who are on the wards of hospitals a long time ago, it was, they were really smoky. Um, and um, so anyway, I'll, I'll end there. Thanks so much for the invitation. I hope we have time for discussion. Thank you very much. That was an excellent talk. Um, really interesting. Uh, we do have a few minutes for discussion and um, I think we can go a little over 1.30, right? So I'll open up the the Florida questions, and we'll try to navigate between online and in, in room. So does anyone have a question or comment? Smita? Thank you for an excellent talk. I wanted to ask about that tail end, because we talk about the tail end that's all health inequity, and that has grown or ballooned during the COVID-19. And what are our tools or how cognizant we need to be? So it is... Uh, not the 40 years ago tobacco has disappeared from this hall, that inequity has gone. Yeah, so, I mean, there's really two ways, I think, if you, if you take my very simple distributions, it really could be two ways to express in the health inequities. One would be the distribution from one population versus another, and, and of course, all populations may differ from what we really want. So take smoking. Uh, we really want zero, right? And, you know, we can look at the educated, the wealthier, and say they're over here, but they're not zero. And then we can go and meet all the populations you know that smoke too, uh, too much. So we, we do have the tail where there may be absolutely unacceptable risk that should be addressed. And then the whole question of how do we shift the distribution? This comes up in so many ways. I, I'm gonna now say, I think we're much better at talking about this than making a difference. And uh, we have increasingly elegant tools to model and map say environmental exposures and what they do. Um, but intervening, is really challenging. I mean, and I think you know, a good example would be vaccination, vaccination hesitancy in the unvaccinated. 
where we need to, needed to make, and we did, special efforts to reach those populations that were not achieving vaccination rates that would be protective. I was just reading about a uh, microgrant program in Colorado that was intended to fund local organizations in places that did not reach the right level of, of vaccination. So that's the kind of thing we need to do. If you look at Denver, there's a massive refinery at the north side of town that's been there forever in communities that have been historically redlined. And uh, for those not from the US, that means that you know home mortgages were not granted. These were communities that remained impoverished. And that was where industry was cited. So how do we reverse that? Well, that's a longer term problem, isn't it? One that it will take a lot of political will to grapple with. So, I mean, your question just opens up, you know, an awful lot of things to think about. So we talk a lot now about social determinants of health. Fine. Then next, what do we, what do we do? Um, great talk. Thanks, John. Um, I love the sentiment at the end about being optimistic. One of the things that strikes me with the pandemic, probably with uh, global uh, global change, climate warming, and so on, is our capacity for forgetting, not learning from the past, but building reports that go and sit in shelves. What are, are your suggestions about improving governance, where we mightn't forget what we know? How many words do I get? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, yeah, of course we forget. And that's that's really a um, a, a problem. And um, were the lessons from SARS one forgotten too quickly? And did our you know ability to uh, stay prepared for the kind of pandemic we've just experienced did that wane too quickly? Abs absolutely. I, you know, I think if you get at the question of um, how do we and 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 those of us that I'll I'll put a public health hat on for the moment make a difference. Um, so we we generate evidence and then we hope somebody will pay attention to it, which may or may not happen. We can speak, we can write op-eds, which may or may not get us anywhere, uh, depending on who we are. We can engage in translational activities and they may matter and make a difference. Um, you can sit on key committees and uh, you know, one thing that happens, you get old enough, you end up on too many of those committees, but some of them actually make a difference. And some of those reports do, and as your question alludes to, some of them don't. And um, you know, I've worked on many different reports for different organizations, some very big that are occupying at least my shelves. And I look at them and go, well, so much for that one. Uh, so, you know, I think that if you keep a scientist, public health practitioner, whatever hat on, you have to look for those. Of course, the other side of this is to go work in the policy space or the science policy space in uh, in government, which many people do. And again, that doesn't assure that you're going to make a difference either, does it? You know, and sometimes you know um, that science can make a difference. And, I, and I'll speak to a couple of personal examples. I started editing and writing the Surgeon General's reports on tobacco in 1984. And in 1986, we wrote the first report that was on involuntary smoking. And this is when Everett Koop, who was arguably our best known Surgeon General, was Surgeon General. And the, uh, it had, the report had three conclusions. The first one said that involuntary smoking is a cause of disease, including lung cancer in non-smokers. And that sentence had regulatory implications, it had public health implications. And for a world that wanted to be smoke free because we had finally become a minority of smokers in the US, adults, it made a difference. So sometimes those science translational steps can make a difference. Sometimes they're incredibly time consuming and, uh, and frustrating. So I, I mean, my one comment there would be don't give up. And climate change, you know, the, the science is there. We've just launched a climate 
and health PhD. I'm still, which I think is probably a good thing. I'm still trying to figure out what it is exactly you do or what your competencies are. But I think building the scientific evidence, I think will stay, uh, will stay important. And I think it's gonna be an ever-changing landscape. So we're gonna to need to keep looking uh, at things. You know, the, the other thing I'd say to students, if you're about to launch your career now, if you're in your career as many years as I've been in mine, you've got a lot of years to go. And uh, just think about it. You know, what are you going to be worried about 40 years from now in public health or in medicine? I don't know. You don't know. But it's going to be something different. There'll be old friends probably still worrying about climate change uh, and um, other things. But I, you know, it said that search for those opportunities and it, it goes beyond, you know, publishing your first, second, third, or fourth, or one hundredth paper. Uh, to keep at it. So it's one thirty. Um, you're officially close to one thirty, but we can have uh, entertain some more questions. I know uh, Mark uh, Rendenz uh, agreed to give some closing remarks, so maybe we'll do that quickly. And if anybody has to be in version D. Um, okay, I'm going to be fairly brief. Um, this is a book written by Jonathan Samet. Is that, was that related to you? Um, John wrote this a long time ago, and I wrote and it uh, says, for Mark, you are building a strong program in Canada. What chapter do you want to do next, John? <laughs> January 2092. Uh, we just had the pleasure of listening to someone who has been influential, because that's the buzzword these days, right? You have influencers and influential. When you get a scientist and you get evidence to influence decision-making, it's enormous. And so, as you just described with the Surgeon General's report, that started everything to change in, in social areas. So, I don't have a chapter yet, but I thought I'd uh, share that with you. Um, I'm going to highlight three things that I think today was uh, excellent in the presentation. Um, history with John Last. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, asking John Last to come and help us uh, at Health Canada at the time to set up the first office of climate change and health. And uh, I, could say, I could say that it was a good experience, uh, but it was a challenging experience because I had a plan and John showed up and he said, oh, this is very interesting, but it's not the right idea. <laughs> At which point he proceeded to kind of reshape and we ended up going in the right direction. I was going in the wrong direction and he was going in the right direction because he was looking at it from a, a much broader, much more appropriate concept as compared to me being in the public service. I was looking at what does the government need? What does the government want? I need to put this screw here and this thing here so that it looks like as if the government's doing something. He said, no, no, no. We have to look at it from a, a much more ecological uh, approach. So um, we've all had, for those of us who have had the opportunity to, to know John Last and to deal with him or to work with him, <laughs> uh, what was that Freudian slip of what? Um, but also for you, uh, we've had the privilege here at this university to have his presence and his contributions. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, all of you at, who are doing EPI will have the, uh, will take the opportunity to look at some of the work that he's done and, and uh, benefit from his, his uh, site of the future. Um, I think the uh, second point is that uh, the issue of evidence that was presented today, like what John was saying, as epidemiologists, we need data. And I'm just going to put this up, not that I made this, not that I, I actually did it, but this is the human age of data. This is data 2012. I bought it on the, in the spur, but it is fascinating in terms of who's got the data. And we are living now in a world where the amount of data that's being collected by the health community is tiny, tiny, tiny. The data that's being collected by industry and by other digital systems is enormous. They know more about me and you than we can possibly, I, more than I know about myself in the digital world. 
So um, I'm just going to, I'll share this if anybody wants to have a quick look at it. Um, but that is what the evidence, this is what we need in terms of influencing decision making. And when we say about decision making, it's about choices. Which options do we want, it, which, which, which options do we want to take and how do we take them? And what's the evidence to do A versus B versus C? And in many instances, A is what needs to be done. Politically, C is what needs to be done. So now the question is, how do you, how do you manage that? And that's a huge, and I think uh, as was asked just, you know, how do you use that, that historical information? So I really enjoyed what you presented in terms of, you know, from the evidence to, you know, going through the pathway to making an actual decision. This is your contribution as scientists in moving forward. When you're doing research, what will that research be used? What, is, what quality evidence can you provide on a particular issue in terms of moving forward? And I think uh, the last point is, is that uh, where are you going to be in 30 years from now? I think uh, John and I had a quick conversation last night and said, you know, would you have seen yourself being here today 30 years ago? And the answer is not really. Um, so be dynamic, be open, look at the what you want to do, how you want to do it, and try to use the, the most information. And, and again, the pathway to influencing, to making value to the, to the information that you're providing was really dis demonstrated here in this presentation today. John, thank you very much for taking, it, uh, taking the time. And uh, I think I have, it's not mine, right? It's just as best. <laughs> so, uh, on behalf of, the, uh, of, of this uh, organization, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Uh, okay. So I think we have the rules of you. Uh, so if anybody wants to stick around and ask more questions to Dr. Samet. Um, yeah, and everybody should come very close. <laughs> and um, But thank you very much. It was a really interesting talk. We look forward to chatting more. So. Thanks, everyone.